Hello and welcome to this Payment Die webinar, Cost Effective KYC and AML with Digital ID Verification. I'm Michael McCaw, Payment Die Editor. Payment providers have been inundated with regulations over the past few years, stretching resources in the name of transparent markets and responsible business behaviour. From PSD2 to GDPR to AML D5, the list seemingly goes on. As regulatory demand demands increase, so it seems does the cost of compliance. And with the increase in importance regulators in Europe and elsewhere have placed on Know Your Customer and anti-money laundering, identity checks have become part and parcel of the payments ecosystem. There is, of course, a variety of tools out there to assist market participants, but digital identity verification must be approached intelligently. As an important step for customers, firms will undoubtedly experience a drop-off in custom should the verification process be too complicated. I'm very pleased to have with me today Steve Panifer, Chief Operating Officer at Consult Hyperion, and Joe Blumen Dow, Vice President of Sales for Europe, MyTech, to discuss the problems, solutions, and the state of the market. Welcome both. Thank you, we'll Michael. We'll have a Q&A session at the end in which we'll invite audience participation. Um, but Steve, I'll hand over to you now if you could oblige us with an overview of the current situation. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, what Michael said in the introduction there is completely correct. Uh, banks ha are subject to um, a lot of regulation today, uh, and that regulation is there for good, for good reason, and the particular focus we have in this webinar around uh, the, the rules to do with Know Your Customer uh, is very important. I mean, th those rules have been put in place to help uh, protect banks and to protect the economy from um, fraud, from money laundering, um, and uh, to prevent terrorism. Um, and, and criminal activity in general. So these, these, these are very important requirements that are placed on banks. And, uh, and so obviously it's, it's incumbent on banks to do what they can or to do what they have to do to, to meet those rules. But also it makes sense for banks to try and do those, do those things, to implement those processes in the ways that are most, most efficient. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is spend a bit of time thinking about some of the challenges that banks face today in meeting the KYC regulations, and um, there are some quite tall challenges that, uh, that, that are presented. Uh, and then in the second half, I'll talk about some of the solutions that are emerging that maybe can, uh, uh, can help to make those processes better, give, give uh, you know, new ideas, new things that banks can be thinking about in terms of how to make those, um, those, things, uh, those things better for themselves. So. Um, First section, then, you know, what, what's the bad news? What, what, what are the challenges that banks have to face? So I've got some, some numbers to show you. So these numbers actually came from a, uh, a report, a white paper, that uh, we wrote, Consult Hyperion wrote, in conjunction with MyTech last year. And these numbers are as relevant today as they were, as they were a year ago, really. So um, headline number there, which actually was from some research done by Reuters, um, that the, uh, the average annual cost that a bank is spending on KYC, AML and KYC related processes of $60 million. That's, that's a huge amount of money. Some larger banks, some top tier banks, will be an order of magnitude higher than that. So this is a serious uh, amount of, uh, of cost to a, to a bank uh, um, in terms of its operational cost. Uh, second row of numbers there, there's some examples of some, some fines that banks have incurred as a result of failings in their um, ML KYC processes. Uh, as you can see, the, the number on the right there, 163 million, that's a big number. And, um, uh, you know, we, I, I don't suppose any bank sets out to, um, to, to have a failing process, but clearly there's a lot to get right here. And it's quite easy for things to be overlooked. And, you know, when that's done, when that happens a lot, when it becomes, you know, systemic, then, then actually that can be quite serious for the bank in terms of its own operation, but also the, the penalty and the, the embarrassment and reputational damage that, that comes with having such a fine. Um, and um, then the other, the other number there, 2,000. So this is the number of new AML-related roles created just in the UK um, a couple of years ago. Um, this is the number that we quoted last year. And you think of the cost of 2,000 people to, to just meet regulatory requirements. This is, this is not providing new business to the bank. It's not increasing the bank's top line. It's just about um, keeping the bank, keeping the lights on. 
in the bank. So that's that's a huge number. And the other, the other thing I should say actually is this: you know, these numbers were were from last year. Uh, has anything changed? Do we still, you know, in the in the last year, has there been any significant improvement in 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 uh, in, in the overall sort of landscape of how banks are dealing with capital? Well, I don't think there has been necessarily. And for those of you that um, have been uh, keeping a keen eye on the press, I mean, not not particularly keen eye, but actually just keeping an eye on the press, we'll we'll, we'll be well aware of the big story that broke on Monday uh, to do with in the Financial Times to do with a. Uh, a potential, I said potential because I don't think anything has been proven yet, but an investigation from the Financial Times suggesting a very large um, uh, uh, money laundering um, uh, issue with a bank in Europe, and um, we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, if, the, if the investigation from the Financial Times is true, then I think we could see you know, a substantial uh, Penalty and fine uh, coming coming to that, that that particular financial institution in the future. Uh, even in the last few days, and share prices dropped. I'm not, I'm not naming them because I mean I could, but I, 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 it, it, they're in the press. But you know, at the moment, it's a story. Um, obviously, what needs to happen next is that the, the, the proper authorities need to go investigate and and determine what's happened in that particular case. But this is a very real issue, and it's something that banks need to be extremely mindful of. Um, Okay, so then the the costs to a bank, you know, there's there's the raw numbers which I've painted and, and given you a, a flavour of. Uh, there are lots of other issues that um, uh, affect and, and create challenges for banks as well. So I've got four things that I've I've um, I've pulled out here. KYC, as I've you know explained, is very important regulation that banks need to comply with, but it's one of many things that compliance officers officers are having to deal with. And so the question is. How do they get enough focus on, on this compared to the whole raft of other things? And Michael, at the beginning, talked through some of those other regulations that are coming down the line and the banks having to deal with at the moment. So that's, that's, that's a big issue. Um, in some of the changes that are going on with uh, AML KYC regulations, there's um, the introduction or the, the increase of the sort of personal accountability and personal responsibility that senior managers will have. Um, so this obviously is a challenge to those individuals, but what it also means is it becomes harder to recruit people into those positions because those have to be people that are prepared to take on that level of, uh, of, of accountability and responsibility. Um, the, the processes are you know, increasing in complexity, they're not getting simpler, and so that need, means you need uh, skilled staff and the demand for those skilled staff is very high, indicated by the number on the previous slide. Uh, so again, the, the, cost of, the cost and difficulty of building uh, teams up to, to implement those processes is a challenge. And, um, and then, to, I guess, to, make, to, to, to just kind of make matters worse for everybody, there are, I mean, there are more organisations being brought into the scope of the regulation. So uh, in the new regulation that's coming out, it's just, just, just actually was... Um, uh, adopted a couple of months ago, um, virtual currency exchanges and uh, and uh, wallet providers are going to be included. Estate agents are coming into scope, and, and and there's others as well. So what that means is the, the, the pool of expertise that we have around doing um, uh, KYC-related processes is spread even more thinly across the the industry as a whole. So then, uh, just moving on to onto that new regulation, so AML. D5, the fifth anti-money laundering directive, um, came to force on the 9th of June, and it will be transposed into uh, local local national laws um, across the European countries um, in January 2020. So that that means between now and then, the uh, national countries, uh, the, the states, will be in the process of of, of, of implementing and building that into their own laws. What that means is banks, in the meantime, uh, and other financial institutions that fall into the, the scope of the, this regulation need to be preparing uh, and need to be getting ready for what the law will be in, uh, from 2020 onwards. Uh, and in terms of the scope of, of what, that, uh, what that directive does, um, there's kind of, you can bucket things in three ways. So there's, there's, there's more checks, in other words, more of what you're doing today. There are um, greater sanctions if you get things wrong. 
and uh, there are some new organisations that are being included, which I've just touched on earlier. Um, so just to pick up on a couple of things here, then um, uh, I guess the, probably the, one of the biggest things that a lot of people are talking about is uh, beneficial ownership. So in terms of more checks, so think of a, 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 an SME or a business opening a bank account. Um, what a bank has to do, they have to do checks, due diligence checks on that organisation. Uh, but then they also need to do due diligence checks on um, the beneficial owners of that organisation. And who is the beneficial owner of a, of, a, of, a, of a company, for example? Well, it might be the shareholders, and there are limits you know, to determining 25% ownership. That's the sort of the limit above above that level of ownership. You need to be um, you need to have uh, due diligence checks done on, on those individuals. Um, but sometimes the ownership is indirect, so the ownership might be via a shell company or it might be via a trust fund um, and you have to go back to the actual beneficial owner not the kind of nominal owner that sits in the middle uh, and that that can mean uh, quite a complex difficult bit of research to figure out actually what is the state of this who actually does own this entity uh, and then having worked out who owns that entity um, going and, and doing necessary checks on them and those people, you know, might live in a completely different country. Um, they might live in a, in a in an environment where you don't have access to the normal tools that you would use to perform um, customer due diligence on on, on, a, on an individual. And so it it can be can become, um, you know, very rapidly quite a costly, difficult difficult exercise. Um, and that's I think why we're seeing, um, you know, so many people being employed in this space at, at the moment now because. Up until this point in time, the tools to do those things automatically uh, haven't existed. The, the data that you need to um, be able to do some kind of automatic checks maybe ha haven't existed. And, and also things like uh, machine learning, data analytics that can provide sophisticated ways of using the data uh, and perhaps you know, um, dealing with things like discrepancies between data in an automated way haven't existed. But that's all, that's all coming. Um, and is, is kind of what we've, we're about to move on to in terms of the, the presentation. Um, the other thing to just point out uh, probably is, the, is the, the middle column here in terms of the, the greater sanctions. Uh, I've mentioned this already, the, 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 the fines that are going to be um, potentially levied on failing organisations here are going to be substantial. I mean, you know, we're talking... Um, uh, Possibly, you know, in an extreme case, 10% uh, of, 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 of gross turnover. That's, you know, that's an enormous number. Um, and um, then, obviously, there's reputational damage, uh, business continuity. So, for example, you might you, you might be told to cease trading whilst uh, you sort out the, the problem. I mean, these are extreme uh, extreme sanctions, but um, the the authorities that in a relevant regulator in each country will have the power to do those things should they deem fit. So there's quite a big stick here that's being presented. And that, that I think is a fair thing because we're dealing with you know, terrorism, uh, financing of terrorism is a massive societal problem. So it's right that um, banks should be held accountable, particularly when, when you know, if they don't do their jobs properly, it can... Uh, it can, uh, you know, allow those sorts of things to, to go, which, which, which none of us, none of us want. Um, so that's that's kind of the background. That's the bad news. There's there's a lot that banks need to be thinking about and dealing with. Um, so let's go on to some good news then. So the good news is that we also uh, live in an environment where there's a rapidly evolving digital identity landscape. And the reason I'm focusing on digital identity is we're talking about KYC, about knowing your customer. Um, there are other parts of that process that I won't focus on today, but really it's about the, the core thing of do you know the person that you're dealing with? Um, and this is a, this is a rich and evolving um, uh, land, uh, industry, I suppose. It's, it's an area that I personally do a lot of work in. Uh, and so in that space, you can see uh, governments, uh, government initiatives to uh, launch um, uh, Identity-related schemes. Uh, there's um, a thing called EIDAS in Europe, which we'll come on to in a second. Uh, outside of Europe, 
various countries are undertaking initiatives to create identity schemes. Some of those are um, uh, government-issued uh, identities. Some of them involve the government working with uh, collaborating with the private sector, um, and indeed in some cases collaborating with banks to create portable identities that allow people in a secure and robust way to take their identity to a bank rather than to, um, uh, you know, a bank has to work it out every time. So that's quite an interesting development. Um, there's um, decentralized is another thing that we'll talk about in a second. Um, I read this is all to do with a lot of the innovation that's happening around blockchain uh, in the fintech space. Um, there's some interesting things happening there which we'll touch on and one of the questions I'm going to ask as we go through is well actually okay these things are interesting but when are they going to be available because we banks need to deal with these issues now they need to have processes and technologies in place that they can deploy now um, and so we'll, 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 we'll just think about that in a, in a minute um, okay so the first uh, example that I wanted to just talk about was with EIDAS so in Europe we have, um, I mean, EIDAS is, is like the flagship European Union Identity Initiative. Uh, it's about getting EU-wide adoption of digital identity. And, and what we have, uh, the situation in Europe is that many of the countries in Europe have national electronic identity schemes. Some of those would be smart cards issued by countries. Estonia is often cited as the, as the sort of uh, the leading example there. Uh, some of those are, are indeed collaborations with banks. So in the Nordic countries, uh, there are flavors of bank ID schemes. Um, and, and each of those schemes has been built for its individual country. And so what EIDAS does is it provides a framework, uh, a, a legal, a technical uh, framework, and possibly in the future a commercial framework for allowing those um, those uh, those identities to 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 work interoperably across across Europe. That's particularly interesting when we think about um, bank account opening, because uh, I heard a statistic that in the UK and I'm sure this is the same in other countries, 50% um, of new account openings are actually cross-border account openings. So if you think about who's opening new accounts, well, it will be um, young people, people going off to university within the country. Uh, and then there'll be people moving into the country, or in the case of uh, the UK, perhaps moving out of the country at the moment. So, um, uh, but it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a researched fact that 50% uh, of those new account openings are cross-border. So having a mechanism to enable cross-border identity is, is, is quite interesting. So that's, that's the IDAS. Now, as the timeline there hopefully illustrates, um, you know, we have the AML, uh, uh, regulatory changes going on along the top, and uh, those are coming to force in uh, in 2020 for AMLD5 anyway. Uh, and and when we look at the the maturity of the EIDAS um, framework and the schemes being kind of co be, being joined into that, uh, it's 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 a it's a long slow moving project. So the basic framework, the basic technology to, for a government to be able to accept an identity from another country, that's, that's going to be in place this month, actually. It, it probably is mostly in place already, but the, the, the deadline was by this month. Um, now, what then needs to happen is each individual country needs to, uh, the terms notify and, um, and, and basically make its scheme available and to have it accredited by the other countries um, to then be available. And some of those countries have notified. Um, but um, how long is it going to take for us to have uh, a good coverage with enough countries uh, having notified their schemes into EIDAS? That's the question we have to ask. The second question is, of those countries, well, in those countries, most of them, the EIDs are actually um, optional. They're not, they're, not, they're not mandatory. So how many people in those customers actually have access to those EIDs already? And then the, the, probably the biggest question for, for this conversation or for this topic is at what point will there be commercial use of that so that the private sector can reuse those identities outside of the government framework? 
Uh, and, and those things, there, there aren't straightforward answers to those that I could give you today. But what I think that means is the time frame we're looking at for EIDAS being available to banks ubiquitously to enable onboarding for bank accounts is, is, is years away. Uh, and so whilst it's interesting and potentially pretty useful, uh, it's, not, it's probably not the tool that you need right now to prepare for AML D5 legislation coming into, you know, be, be, being, um, coming into force in each country in 2020. Um, so then let's move on to the next one, decentralized identity. So the, the reason I picked this one out is in the identity landscape, in the identity community, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of um, thinking going on, innovation in this area, uh, and some pretty interesting projects, I have to say. Um, and really, the, the way that I would describe this for the purposes of this, this um, um, webinar is as follows. So today, we have a situation where identity, digital identity, is siloed within organizations. So when I create, uh, when I open a bank account with one bank, they go through whatever process they need to to determine my identity. And from that point on, they have a version of my digital identity. It's my bank account with them. Uh, if I then go and, I don't know, get a mortgage from another financial institution, well, they have to go through the same process. Uh, and so I end up with, and, you know, if I get a credit card from somewhere else, I have to go through the same process. So I end up with multiple siloed uh, and, and kind of separated digital identities. They're, they're, they're not joined together. And I can't easily take an identity from one and take it to the other. Uh, and that's not just, not just in banking, that's, that's across the entire internet, actually. Uh, and so the change that the decentralized approach is taking is to say, well, let's put the customer at the center. And let's say, well, let's collect the, the information about the customer. In, can we build a system that enables that, that information to be collected in a way that is verifiable, in a way that it's robust, so that um, it meets the kinds of standards that we would expect from the sorts of applications we're talking about here. Um, but because it's, because it's collected around the individual, I then have something that's portable. It's not, I, I have the, the, the kind of repository of my identity. So then when I go to, a, to a, a new financial institution, I could say, and they say, well, who are you? I could say, well, this is me, here I am, and I have all the digital evidence I need to give you. This is the... Uh, the, uh, the objective of um, the sort of decentralized identity approach. And the ways that that is being delivered is through a combination of um, uh, kind of personal data vault kind of technology in conjunction with distributed ledger technology. So this is all really interesting. Um, the other thing that it provides as well because of the, the, the blockchain element is the potential to, to have a high degree of provenance around the data you can see Maybe not, maybe not the actual data itself, but you can see maybe some uh, a record of, of, of how, that, how that identity was used over time, which obviously is quite useful if you're thinking about um, uh, trying to identify identities that are fabricated, so synthetic identities, for example, or if you're trying to, trying to find out identities that maybe have been compromised in some way, that could be quite interesting. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this particular space. What's the time frame for it? I, I would say, even with the, 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 the leading initiatives, for this to be um, available wide scale, you know, ubiquitously for banks to use for the sorts of things we're asking the question about today, my guess is five to ten years. Um, I mean, I, I'm a great supporter of a lot of the work that's being done here. I think it's fantastic, but it's just not the practical thing that we need right now. So that brings us on to the third thing I wanted to just talk about. Uh, briefly, which is mobile technology, and um, um, the, the situation with mobile technology is quite different. So mobile are, are ubiquitous, um, penetration of them is extremely high, um, and obviously in particular I'm thinking about smart mobile phones here. And uh, smart mobile phones, highly capable devices, high quality cameras, powerful processors, um, uh, high band, you know, with networks are increasingly high bandwidth. I mean, 5G networks are only just around the corner, uh, and coverage of those networks is is improving the whole time. So what this does is it gives us a, a great tool through which we can do some digital 
identification type processes and the technology that um, that uh, Joe's going to tell us about shortly it does, does just that you know, it's, uh, it's uh, using the, the camera to scan a document maybe doing some biometric check using that high quality camera um, and the great thing about this technology is that it's available today in fact it's been you know, there are people already using this technology in, in, in banks um, um, and so it's, it's already available and if anything we're kind of in the maturing stage rather than the sort of innovation stage um, interesting slide to show you just uh, kind of as I wrap up my part so this slide here is taken from a study that was done by um, company uh, consulting firm in the Netherlands called Innopay that uh, we're quite friendly with and um, what they did was they they basically researched the way that KYC is done across a uh, number of financial institutions in the Netherlands uh, so whilst it's the Netherlands specific I think it probably is not it won't be that dissimilar in other other kind of uh, Western European countries and um, you can see a whole bunch of different methods down the down the left there and the institutions on the top. Um, what what's clear from this is there are kind of two, actually three standout lines, so three three horizontal lines where there are lots of ticks. Um, the um, the first one I wanted to mention was the money transfer one. So I see this as a sort of a legacy method. So you'll be aware that uh, there are a lot there are organisations. I mean PayPal is quite famous for doing this where you um, maybe do a transaction, a microtransaction to someone's bank account and then you get them to verify the amount, for example, that was, transacted, that was sent to their bank account. What that does is it shows you that the person is in possession of a, of a bank account. So that could be part and parcel of your uh, due diligence processes. I, I, I see this as a kind of a legacy process. Um, that that kind of link to the other bank account for me seems a little bit loose. It's not. It's not that. Um, it doesn't seem that rigorous. Um, but it's, it's, it was. It was one of the things. One of the tools that we. One of the only tools we had in the kit bag, say four or five years ago. So, so you know that, that's why it's been adopted. But I think you'll see the number of banks using that will start to diminish over time. On the other hand, uh, the other the other two rows there. So the scanning documents row and the uh, combined with doing some kind of selfie check uh, I think those 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 if we looked at the, the equivalent chart five years ago those rows would probably have been blank they're now there are lots of organizations uh, doing that I'm not saying that they're doing it for all their customers but they're doing it as part of their overall process um, and with the, uh, the importance of mobile and mobile being ubiquitous I imagine that that's a growing a growing part of their of their sort of um, tool bag and armory uh, in terms of addressing these these uh, regulations. So just to wrap up, then, um, what should you do if you're a financial institution? Well, there's clearly a lot of emerging technology in this space. Um, as as you look to the future, clearly you should have a roadmap to think about how how best you can employ that technology to as best you can automate these processes and that automation is, is good for managing your own internal costs but also it makes the, the, the whole experience better for your customers as well um, and an early thing on that roadmap and I think an immediate thing on that roadmap should be mobile technology because because it's there because it's tested because we can see the adoption um, to not do that uh, to me just seems I mean it seems like, to, to me it seems like a no-brainer you, you, you should be Using that technology, any 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 financial institution could should, because it gives optimal um, user experience and and also potentially some quite robust uh, security as well. Particularly useful for customers that you don't want, that don't want to, uh, to to come into a branch. Um, I'm going to stop there. That's my time, up. and I'm going to hand over to Joe from MyTech, who's going to uh, tell us a bit about uh, MyTech's um, kind of proposition offering in this space. Joe. Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve. Um, hello, everybody from me. My name's Joe Blumendahl, and um, <clears throat> hopefully to, uh, to Steve's point, uh, we have some good news to share with you. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for um, laying the land there. I think uh, everybody agrees that on the long run, um, 
EID and EIDAS and frameworks like that and decentralized uh, identities will will be the path forward. Uh, in the meantime, we're probably going to have to use other technologies like uh, like you've just said. And I think uh, MyTech has um, some of that today available, proven for you to implement immediately and uh, and start using. Um, Further down my presentation, I'll um, show you the technology uh, uh, from a consumer perspective so that you have an idea of what it looks like. But before that, let me just introduce you to, to our company. MyTech is a, is a global leader in digital identity verification, and specifically in, in the mobile space. So that, that's what we're exceptionally good at. And uh, we're a NASDAQ listed company. We're the only NASDAQ listed company in, uh, with this technology in this space. And that means that we are very often seen as a, a very reliable uh, and strong partner to work with, specifically by banks and financial institutions. Obviously, everything is transparent. So you can see we are a very healthy, uh, profitable company. We do have a global presence, um, which is helpful if you are a large international company. But the local offices in San Diego, Amsterdam, uh, Barcelona, and throughout um, Europe um, do service uh, in-country clients as well. Um, we have a lot of consumers using our technology. There are 80 million consumers uh, using our technology, which means that we have all that knowledge and experience to build on and uh, build our roadmap out with. Uh, we have document experts working for us uh, for many, many years up and, uh, to border control level, uh, and that helps us understand where we should be uh, in front of the fraudsters and how we can, can stay ahead of them. And there's a lot of financial institutions relying on our technology, more than 6,000 today, which means that, for instance, in North America, um, uh, 10 out of 10 largest banks uh, use MyTex technology and trust us. So just wrapping up a bit on Steve's points, what are, what are the key drivers really behind the technology, what, what keeps, uh, keeps up, us up at night and gets us out of bed to go back to work? Well, there are a couple of key drivers. There's obviously the regulatory pressure that is building, the terrorism, identity fraud, globalization, all the key words that we see have changed the landscape. Also, the fact, like Steve said, that uh, in any average bank, 50% of the new bank account openings are from abroad. So um, that regulatory pressure is, is building, and there, we need solutions to, to uh, solve those problems. And then, obviously, the digital natives have high expectations around um, uh, the user experience. I mean, I'm ordering an Uber or I'm booking a room through, uh, through Airbnb, and I want to open a bank account. So why would that take seven days and involve paper-based uh, processes? But also think of the digital transformation. Um, um, uh, the world is getting smaller. Um, regula regulation is not just local anymore. Um, we need um, uh, technology that will help us uh, improve and, and, uh, and digitize the processes we have today. And the economic pressure, the economic advantages from using di digital um, uh, technology is, is quite apparent as well. You can reduce costs. Uh, on the acquisition of, of new clients, um, and you can improve the return on the equity and, and, and really still today, in many ways, create a competitive edge if you implement it well. So to bring it up to a bit of a bit higher level, let's have a quick look at um, really what do we have? Uh, I think Steve talked a bit about uh, what we don't have and what the problems are, uh, but what we do have, what we do all have is a governmental issued identity document. Um, on that, we have information that we need in an AML and in a KYC process. So my tech has become the expert in bridging the gap from the physical world uh, through mobile channel into the digital world. If you look at current methods of verifying somebody's identity, that could involve face-to-face -face interaction, which really means um, get out of the chair, go outside, 
get in the car, drive to an office or a bunch, and then there's face-to-face -face interaction there. Alternatively, we could rely, uh, you could rely on data from credit bureaus um, or uh, KBAs. And we all know that with the breaches lately, not just in Europe, but across the world, that type of uh, technology or that type of data is, is, is much far less reliable than maybe five or ten years ago. So being able to go back and say, well, I, I want to use a, um, uh, a much better source, a physical source, um, seems like the, a good way forward. But that's not extremely easy, obviously, because you need to be able to capture that information and you need to be able to process it. Um, and that's where our product, MyTech's product, Mobile Verify, um, uh, comes into play. Um, really two things that you would want to do. Uh, you want a seamless and frictionless user experience. No clunky methods with digitizing documents and uh, making it uh, very difficult for users to do. Or seem seemingly um, uh, on the outset easy methods but with poor image capture at the, uh, at the outset of the process. Uh, and then when, once we've captured an image, and not just identity documents, but bear in mind we need to also prove that Joe is actually, actually uploading his own document, um, we need to be able to process those images and we need to verify the authenticity of the identity document as well as um, do an anti-impersonation check so that I know that I've uploaded, um, the bank knows that I've uploaded my own, uh, my own document. Now really, we've very often been positioned as a fraud prevention tool, which we are, obviously. That's what we're going to help banks and financial institutions, but also beyond that, uh, marketplaces, peer-to-peer um, uh, 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 -peer service providers um, prevent fraud. But in many cases, we are an enabler. So we can help you say yes to more good customers. Because really that's the 99.9% .9 of the population is just, well, it's just a, a genuine people like you and I who want to get through a process, a red tape process, as quickly and as easily as we can. So the key message is can we get these people through the process quickly and frictionless so that you can onboard them and welcome them as a new, uh, as a new client. Hence, decrease abandonment. Because we can see, Steve mentioned the number of 20, 25%, I think, but I've seen processes, and I'll be honest, that's maybe two or three years ago, initial processes in digitization where abandonment rates of 70 to 75% were not uncommon. So only three out of 10 that attempted to get through the process actually got through the process. And obviously that's, that's not a good experience, but also not a good investment. Um, we want to replace uh, or augment outdated methods. Um, current methods uh, either imply people traveling around, copying uh, information and sending it through, uh, uh, through mail or um, using database or bureau checks uh, instead of uh, um, governmental issued documents. Uh, moving into different markets uh, whilst meeting regulatory requirements and cutting operational costs. All of that can be captured um, by having a good user experience, but also then having a good enough image of whatever you've captured to actually verify the identity. So how does, how does MyTech do that? Um, we are so well um, equipped because we have um, basically the money to spend on uh, AI and machine learning, which uh, is the way forward, we think. Uh, currently, uh, most of the providers will have a mix of manual verification and automated verification, uh, automated verification being the bulk, obviously. And moving forward, we're going to be able to um, uh, move the manual verification and teach machines to do whatever our uh, document experts do today uh, so that can be done automatically. So this continuous engine relies on our identity document expertise, this uh, growing team of border control level uh, experts, the massive data flow that comes through our systems, being a company in this business for decades really now, we have millions of documents running through our system that can then be used to uh, determine new fraud techniques or new types of documents coming through and as we as we do that we see that uh, uh, we're improving our services 
uh, continuously. So if we take a, a step back, what's key in our process? Well, key is getting a good image. So rubbish in is always rubbish out, also with, with my tech services. So if we look at our product, MySnap, which is mature, which is the product that is used by the 80 million consumers, you can see on the left that if, we, if our clients don't use a good capture tool, you'll get images with glare on there or skewed and corners cut off. But if you do use MySnap, you're helping the end user, uh, which is comfortable, makes it more frictionless for them to capture good images. We can communicate back through their own device and say, please reduce glare or get closer to the document. And that then generates a good image that we can start using for verifying. And what we then do is we um, uh, verify the authenticity of an identity document through several things. And this is just one example. You can see here an image of a passport, and we'll look at the structure. We'll look at the bio data. We'll look at things that are the mach machine readable, but also the security features, signature, anything that we can really find on that document uh, that is relevant for us. And it's, uh, it's, uh, um, the document experts have always explained to me there's, there's, it, there might be something wrong somewhere or the quality of the image doesn't tell us, uh, give us access to certain information, but always fraudsters change one or two or three things in one document to try and trick the system, so ultimately we'll always uh, be, able to, be able to find them. This is also information that is used to pre-fill, obviously, a form or the mobile app that the, the technology is embedded in, um, taking that piece of the friction out of the process as well. Now, the other part that is key in um, fulfilling the, the requirements, the, uh, the, making the compliance uh, guys happy, is proving that, like I said, Joe is actually uploading his own identity documents. And the way we do that is put through biometric verification. So we've got something you have, your passport, and we're going to use something you are. And key with um, face comparison is the capture of the face and the way we capture the face. You need liveness detection to determine that it's not being spoofed, so we know there's a live person in the in the process. And then with the captured image, we're going to have to compare that to what to the image we've cut out of the uh, identity document that has been provided. And we give, you, give that back to you. It's completely automated service in a simple match, no match uh, scoring. Um, and then combined with the scoring on the identity document, that will give you a, a good indication of um, am I uh, um, am I talking to or going to onboard the person who they say they uh, are? So have a, let's have a look at a couple of use cases, how this has been implemented live. Uh, like Steve said, we're more in the, in the maturing phase of, of, of this uh, type of technology. It's not just a startup and, and, and discovery. Uh, there are real live examples out there. A good one is a company uh, based out of the Netherlands called MoneyU. And MoneyU was founded um, um, quite some time ago as a fully digital bank. And being a completely digital bank, hence having, don't, not having any branches, means that they needed to onboard their new customers uh, digitally, but also any time and anywhere they are. So they chose to partner with uh, MyTech, and they in, in, uh, integrated Mobile Verify into their app, and that allowed them to capture the information like we just saw and capture their face. And with that, uh, MoneyU was able to start onboarding their, uh, their clients. Initially, they had a paper-based process, but with, uh, with MyTech's technology, we could cut back down the uh, onboarding process to, to minutes instead of days. Um, and they could access their accounts now much more easily and quicker than, uh, than before. And today, MoneyU is still a, uh, a very successful bank uh, growing beyond the borders of the Netherlands, and we're going with them uh, in that direction. A different story is a company called, uh, called Knox. Uh, they're a leading uh, digital payments platform based on, on blockchain technology. Um, and, and obviously, they wanted a safe and compliant onboarding experience, not, not because they're regulated. Well, they will be, start becoming regulated now, but because trust and safety in their world is, uh, is a very, very uh, uh, strong requirement as well. 
and they had grown their manual review team, in-house review team, uh, trying to keep up, especially late last year with the growing demand. Uh, and ultimately, once they called us, their uh, onboarding took 12 hours or more. At some point, we were up to 20 hours on, on their side, and they knew we need to outsource this. We need specialists to help us with this. So they, they implemented Mobile Verify and asked them to start using that technology. Um, and <clears throat> within, um, within a very short time uh, frame, Knox could uh, start onboarding people who, instead of the 12, 15 hours, now in five minutes. And uh, the, the best number, obviously, there is that they grew their user base by 214%, because you can understand that if uh, I'm looking to onboard myself with a, a payments platform, uh, uh, and we uh, and uh, one of the providers, it's, it, it takes forever or is expressed in hours, and the other one, it only takes five minutes. Uh, that's, that's probably where I'm, uh, I'm going to go. And here's what our technology looks like in, um, in real life. Obviously, my tech doesn't sell apps. We sell technology that you embed. And if you look at the screen now, you can see how our capture technology works in real. This is my snap. And intentionally, this is blurred, by the way, because it's a real passport in that uh, video, and we don't want uh, PII on the, on the screen. But you could see how the user got closer, prompted, was prompted to get closer to the uh, identity document. And then when MySnap was happy, it automatically captured the image of the identity document. Now, if we look at the capturing of the face, which is Again, a very fast video because this is what it, what it looks like in reality. It has to be quick and, 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 and frictionless. You can see here now the user is prompted to get closer, blink, and automatically the MySnap tool captures the image of the face. And on the background, passive liveness has been done. And obviously, with the blinking, we're doing the active liveness. And just to show you what the results look like. You would never have this in a consumer-facing app, but in, 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 uh, in um, uh, the output of the results would look like this. I'm seeing one waiting for the video to come up. We present our um, results in a score, which means that we translate what we found uh, back in a score from 0 to 1,000 uh, for the document, for the face, and for overall. And with that information, you can craft your uh, business rules and you can craft your onboarding engine in such a way that you can decide what thresholds you will uh, accept. So that's my tech, the technology, and what it looks like in real life. Um, I think we're open for questions now, uh, Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, well, first off, uh, just a, a huge thanks to, uh, to both you gentlemen. There's some really, really interesting points there, and, and great to see the technology in action. Um, I've got a few questions for myself, and, um, of course, the audience have very kindly sent through a few. I've just been watching them coming in. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover them all. Um, so first off, um, with the current regulatory environment, um, Joe, will push this one to you. Um, how do you think financial institutions are rising to the challenge um, of more frequent and in-depth identity checks? Uh, I think um, um, the, the, everybody realizes that there's a need for change. I mean, um, the, like I put out in that one slide, all the drivers behind this technology. And there are some fast movers there. Um, they, um, they realize that with uh, new regulations, AML D5, um, this is still a competitive advantage. Um, so we're looking, we're working with payment providers who are looking ahead of the curve uh, and, and looking beyond manual review of documents and, and really outsourcing it to an expert like, uh, like MyTech. Um, um, but there's also on the other end, uh, there are still companies out there that are not doing this. So um, uh, we, I really think that um, some of them are not rising to the challenge and potentially are going to uh, be behind at some point soon, uh, which means that uh, a catch-up will be more difficult. I imagine that catch-up process would be quite, uh, uh, quite cumbersome. Steve, what, what are your thoughts there? Steve's just 
having some audio problems there. Um, well, for, oh, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, my mistake. Um, yeah, so what I was what I was thinking was a year ago when we, when we read the paper, there was a more marked difference, I think, between what challenger banks were doing versus the the sort of you know incumbent uh, banks, uh, and that's because you know the challenger bank, then obviously you know you might be app only, um, you're you're looking to do things to engage with your customer, you probably don't have a branch network. So you're lived, you have to you have to use technology because you have no choice, um, and that 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 remains the same. But I think what we would see now is that there's obviously an increasing, uh, you know, mobile banking is 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 the, is the, the first channel, is is the primary channel through which uh, banks are, are delivering. And obviously, in that channel, it makes complete sense for them to start adopting this technology, which is what we see what we saw on that slide with the you know the examples from the Netherlands. So I'm, I'm just monitoring um, the questions coming in from the audience, um, and while we're on the, the kind of the regulatory scene, um, uh, I've seen one just popping in there. Um, how much engagement do you have with regulatory authorities such as central banks to support your MySnap app acceptance? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, good question. Um, we don't interact with them directly. Only in one or two cases we've been uh, we've been contacted by regulator by, by regulators in countries, and in a handful of cases we've been in front of them presenting our technology. But we, as a standalone company, do not have to be compliant. We help our clients become compliant. So the path and the conversations with uh, regulators is always with with uh, with clients or with people with companies that are trying to become compliant uh, have to interpret the legislation and 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 the directives and uh, take us along to have that conversation and support them from a technology perspective. It's an interesting place in the market, um, and we've had a few questions come along along a well a similar line to a, well a point I was planning on raising myself. So, so onboarding aside, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what are some of the other use cases you've seen for digital ID verification, Joe? Um, well, onboarding is is one of the bigger drivers. Although um, verification and authentication obviously is coming is coming closer and closer together. So we see uh, other use cases where re-verification uh, uh, consumers, customers who have forgotten their passport or. Um, trying to log on too many times, uh, they might be the rightful owner of an account and they need to be re-verified and, and our technology is well suited to do that. And also we're, now we're talking about regulated space, but think of, of the, of the uh, trust space as I sometimes call it. So um, um, where we have companies in the sharing space, I'll be uh, looking to uh, rent your car or rent a room in your house for a period of time. And there's a similar challenge to what banks have um, but now it's driven more by trust. I'd like to know who's going to use my car, and, uh, and our technology obviously is uh, uh, quite well suited to cater for that as well. Excellent. And uh, Steve, just a, just a few points that you made earlier, um, kind of about the drivers um, towards this type of technology. So is it really the threat of negative outcomes like fines from regulators that are actually driving change for financial institutions? And to, just to go a step further than that, um, how much of the industry is driven by fear of bad outcomes? Well, yeah, interesting question. I mean, I think um, the, the fines and the sanctions certainly make people sit up and listen. And, and we've had a case, uh, a customer of ours, uh, an organization that's taken action in the last year, fairly significant action in terms of reviewing what they do uh, in direct response to something they've seen happen to another organization. So I think you know, that's, that's just one example, but it's an anecdote to show that there are, that there, there are um, financial institutions out there who, who are concerned that they don't want to be the next one that's you know, in the press, um, aside from the, 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 the cost of a fine. Um, the other thing I would say as well is that regulation, obviously, is, as I was pointing out, eats up a lot of budget. And actually, banks don't want to be, you know, they want to be innovative. They want to be developing new products. They don't want to be spending all of their time uh, dealing with, with regulation. That, does, that doesn't help them to grow their businesses. So, so I think what new technology does is it provides a route to deal with that regulation more efficiently 
allowing them then to focus on the things that are more important to them as a business. In other words, responding to customer demand, being uh, an organisation that you know that, that addresses the needs of their customers in a in a in a in a relevant and um, engaging way. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I think on the on the other side of the maybe the other side of the coin, um, um, we talk to um, uh, groups and within our clients uh, who obviously, like um, Steve say, are very concerned. But the other side is um, if we if there's technology that can help. Um, um, get a great user experience in place, then they're very interested. So that's that's maybe another driver. They're, they really see the new regulations as an opportunity to be ahead of the market and uh, and maybe dig into new uh, user groups or in, uh, be able to um, uh, operate across borders without having to have brick and mortar there. So uh, at my take, we like to think that it's not just a hurdle, uh, but it could it could definitely, with good technology, be an opportunity. Um, to to, to fully optimize the digital experience. And of course, it would be remiss of us to, to, to speak of, um, well, any type of technology without considering, uh, well, the legalities or the criminal side of things. So what kind of fraud attempts have you seen uh, trying to get past the ID verification process, Joe? Yeah, well, we, maybe you can break it apart in, in, in two worlds. Real fraud, um, so uh, people that uh, doctor a document, change the photo, or, or change some some type of some uh, piece of the uh, biometric information on there, or the machine readable zone. And the other one is just 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 funny attempts. Really, uh, we've got all sorts of attempts. People that take pictures of something else, maybe their cat, or uh, uh, just uh, just anything lying around on their table, just to see if they can get. Through uh, get through the process. Uh, one of the funniest ones was where we had somebody who had a handwritten note saying that um, they had a driver's license but couldn't take couldn't find it, and uh, and they just took a picture of, of of that handwritten note and sent it in uh, and hoped that that would uh, that that would be sufficient. So we see we see all sorts of uh, uh, things spreading from very organised uh, fraud to. Uh, people um, and not understanding what the process should be and uh, trying to get through with other uh, images and documents. Well, I suppose it's, it's, it's good to try, to try different ways of doing things anyway. That's an interesting example. Um, so, and I'm growing wary of time, so we've got about a minute of uh, time left, gentlemen. So um, can I just sort of round up on the future of things? So 30 seconds each, uh, and Steve, we'll go to you first, um, if that's okay. Uh, what do you think the future looks like for identity verification? 30 seconds. Yeah, so I think the future is multifaceted. This is not about finding one particular method that solves all everyone's problems. I think there are a range of methods out there. I come from, an, from a security background, and we always talk about defense in depth. So the idea that you can, you can marsh and bring together different tools uh, and have an approach that's flexible, relevant to your customers' needs, that work in different channels, that's the, that's, the, that's the way to go forwards, and obviously the technology we've spoken about today, I believe, is, is, is definitely should be part of that armory. Wonderful. And Joe? I agree. I mean, the layered approach, that's probably, Steve, what you, what you mean, that, that is the forward. And if you look into more detail, I think it's going to move towards more biometric verifications that are, are less intrusive, or that are faster, um, uh, things like uh, tracking of micro-movements whilst doing the liveness detection on face. I think that's probably going to uh, uh, happen. And third, fa third factor verification, um, like easier NFC scanning, so using the technology that is out there and in our device and in our documents uh, more regularly um, is probably going to uh, to uh, uh, emerge more and more in the in the months and years to come. Excellent, great stuff, gentlemen. Uh, just just to thank you both uh, very much um, for your time today. That's been really really interesting, really informative, and I for one have certainly learned a lot. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us, and we hope to. Hear hear from you again uh, sometime soon with Payment Day. Thank you and good day.